So welcome all. Uh, Please that you accepted my invitation to be here today. Um, I won't be taking answers from the stage after, so uh, if you want to chat, I invite you to, um, well, I'll, I'll contact info there and um, I'll be about, I'll give you some info later how you can uh, find me to continue the conversation. Um, so what I offer you today is that before you leave here, I'll give you new perspectives and tools uh, at your disposal. Um, that you can use to finish current projects uh, and give you confidence that future projects will likewise be completed. And I don't want you to take anything I say as you know a doctrine or set of rules, more as a, like a tool set that you can make use of, um, modify, dispose of as you see fit. A near universal truth of uh, living a creative life is we collect. Uh, this was a, a, a photo from the beginning of COVID I did of trying to get my unfinished projects uh, organized. Um, and you know, personally I've labored for years under the shame that that brings of, of just, you know, constantly starting things that, um, yeah, end up on shelves like so. And every time I would start a new project, friends and family would roll their eyes and you know, I, I knew they were talking about me about that a new, yet soon to be unfinished project that I was starting. Uh, but then one day something changed. Um, I started finishing projects. Uh, and just as important, I got better at not taking on projects that were sure to stall. Um, I mean, you're here today, so I'm, I'm guessing unfinished projects are, are a thing in your life. So, so take a moment and feel that for yourself. Like, close your eyes if you like. Imagine in the near future you as having a reputation of someone who finishes projects. Yeah, right? And when you do take on a project, you do so with the confidence that you'll complete it. All that weight from all those unfinished projects lifted from your shoulders. So how does that feel? So stick with me here, we'll, uh, we'll go through some, some thoughts I have on this. So I believe that create, creative energy is meant to flow freely uh, from us as a way of contributing to the collective, our community, uh, the world. Uh, at a deeper level, I believe that through creative expression, we find connection. And connection's precious. Some even say connection is everything. Uh, so I coach high-performing creatives and working with them, I see the same patterns time and time again that I see in all people, including myself. Uh, I repeatedly observe that humans are awful at finishing what they start and there's a common cycle to the creative process. So I find the hero's journey model by American writer Joseph Campbell to be a useful way to visualize this process. Um, and here's a simplified sketch of the hero's journey. So at the top, we have a call to adventure, so this would be the project that lands in our lap, whether it's inspiration or uh, a client coming to you or your boss giving you a project. How, however that comes to you, there's this, this um, call to, to take a journey. And, you know, a whole bunch of stuff happens along the way as you're, as you're uh, working towards uh, the end. But then, in the middle, we get this abyss, this death, and this is the part in um, projects where everything kind of comes to a grinding halt and, you know, it, it's hard to push through. So. And then from there, you know, there's, there's, if we can push through that, make it through there, there's a transformation and we can return, we, we are able to finish our project, thereby delivering it to, uh, to society and from that you get the benefits of, well, I'm sure there's, you know, unlimited benefits, but for me it's a matter of that, that connection, that gift we're giving back. Um, so about 10 years ago, I realized that I have uh, a talent or gift, if you will, of assisting people struggling in this area up in the, the return, you know, from that abyss upwards. Um, I discovered this about myself through work I was doing, uh, producing Maker Faire events. I produced them around the world, which was initially about offering people the excuse to uh, share their creations, you know. Come in, show and tell others about the cool things they're doing, and, and here's some space to do it. Uh, so humans would attend the event and uh, talk to makers about their creations. Uh, and through these interactions, some magic happens for both the maker and the attendee, and both leave changed, 
you know, I'm not sure that process was always conscious to them, but it was something I saw all the time, was that there was definitely an energy exchange and, and uh, you know, people would get something out of sharing their work. Uh, and then, so in observing this, I realized that oftentimes the real value I was delivering was not that connective interaction so much, rather I was facilitating the push many needed to uh, get their projects show ready, that, that being, you know, finished enough that they could deliver it and show it and share it off uh, with the world. Um, and, and that's where the magic connections happen, I, f I feel. Um, and they wouldn't have taken place had the maker not shared their creativity. Uh, so my personal work has changed along with the evolving world, you know. Struggled to, to see in a world where uh, big festivals like this or events like Maker Faire don't really happen as often anymore. And, well, the Maker Faire is another story altogether. Uh, yeah, like how, how would I uh, help creatives with that return journey? And I realized that I, I could just work with people one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so that's kind of where my world has gone these days, is uh, work on, working one-on-one -on -one with uh, creatives committed to making that return journey. So artists or other creatives who, um, yeah, they're, they're driven and they, they have high stakes projects often. So uh, ostensibly they don't have a choice. Uh, so tell you a little story. It's an old story. It's of Odysseus, uh, king of Ithaca. He's returning from uh, returning home along with his men at arms, uh, sailing in 12 ships. They've just finished a 10 year campaign in the Troy War, uh, Trojan War as it's called. Uh, after being driven off course by storms, they lose themselves uh, in the land of the Lotus Eaters for some time. Later they encounter a Cyclops who eats his fill of them. They escape the Cyclops. There's additional sailing, storms again, a giant eats more of them, destroys 11 of their ships, leaving just Odysseus' vessel. Odysseus is seduced by a, a, a witch goddess. His crew is turned to swine. Um, they can escape back on their return journey. They deal with sirens, monster whirlpools. There's mutiny, more storms, and a shipwreck, his final ship. Finally, upon uh, friendly ground, Odysseus secures uh, safe passage home and the journey from Troy. So this journey from Troy took an additional 10 years. So 10 years after the war, or 10 years at war, and then another uh, equal measure of return home. So does this remind you of any of the projects you've worked on? <laughs> so I, sh I share this poorly abridged narrative with you because I enjoy the metaphor uh, offered. If the Odyssey is read as a metaphor for your own journey, then you'll certainly find some points of reflection in it, as I have. Um, and I also bring it up because it makes some of what I'm uh, talking about uh, have more meaning. So here you are, sitting here today, you've tried things in the past to finish projects, and you keep ending up shipwrecked on a new island. What was the last tool you used uh, to keep yourself on track? Did you use project management tools, time management tools, life management tools? I want you to consider a different approach. Now, you can still use your current tool set. Information still needs to be organized and accessible. It's just, I don't actually think that's what's holding you back. I suspect that what does hold you back is more a matter of, of your perspective, and shifting that perspective in subtle ways might just do more for you than all the world's spreadsheets and Gantt charts. So the first perspective shift I want to discuss is really basic. Perhaps you've already integrated this into your life. Uh, the internal versus external energy, desire, and time generated internally. Now, uh, now there's also the external resources such as money and people. And I'm sure many of you question my inclusion of time under internal, and we'll address that, that uh, shortly. Um, on the slide, the arrow represents perception of time, uh, which I like to think of as entropy which is why I have it increasing. As entropy increases, we often experience internally a loss of energy, focus, um, fatigued mind and body. And on the external side, we get, well, that which is not within our control. Oh, yeah. To that point, when I think of entropy, this Nick Cave quote always comes to mind. All the things, all things move towards their end. Of this, you can be sure. 
Um, maybe it's too dark, I don't know, but anyway. On the subject of the external, if we put uh, the fate of our project completely in the hands of the external, and this includes software, funding, collaborators, then we abdicate our sovereignty over the project's life and thereby increase the chance um, that success will not come, or at least minimize our role in it. Uh, but this doesn't mean we have to do it all ourselves. That used to be my approach, um, and I can tell you micromanaging is exhausting. Uh, some of you know this feeling well. But how do we take ownership and still gain the benefits of external resources? So we can instead shift our role uh, in a project by taking on a heroic mindset. If you were the hero in your story, then it goes to reason that you need to take heroic action, just as Odysseus does in his adventures. Although your spear may break and your ship may sink and your crew may be eaten by monsters, uh, remember those are all externals. Just It's, it's about uh, taking ownership of the outcomes you have control over, and you'll just as likely find that with ownership comes additional control. And again, this is just a mind, mindset shift. I don't, and I don't use control here in the sense of holding power over another person, rather control of variables or different words, um, increased ability to affect outcome. Uh, one other point of clarification and uh, with ownership, I also don't mean that you actually need to change anything in your environment. I just, yeah, simply shift your perspective. All right. So as a hero, the project and subsequent success are yours to deliver. You can lead teams, armies, or even henchmen uh, to assist you in completing your project, but at the end of the day, it's your project. Right? Even if you're working on just a small part of a larger project, no matter how small, the to it's that, that makes the totality of your project. So that's, that's kind of the start of that shift. Uh, if you employ people or software to help you, just do so knowing that they can't be expected to finish it. They're, they're there to unburden where possible. Um, but they're the heroes in their own stories, and that's on them to find their heroic, heroic energy and finish their objectives. But if they should falter, you still have your part to complete. Without taking ownership of the outcome, you don't have the ability to change things. So by holding a heroic mindset, you may also find it easier to not be swayed by the opinion of others. Their analysis of you is just them trying to find understanding. That's all. Let them write their own story the way they want. It's not beneficial for you to try to alter theirs or allow their story to alter yours because there's a good chance that you're not the hero in someone else's telling of things. So put simply, uh, think about the project and your role in it as metaphor. You're the hero, and does knowing you're the hero change your engagement? Only you get to decide that. Um, so now let's discuss one of the more common stated problems with any project. Chronoception, more commonly known as uh, perception of time or simply time. And I have a few thoughts on this. Uh, it seems to me like as humans, we spend a great deal of time talking about time and worrying about time. We try to measure time but experientially know it's flexible. Measuring time is like measuring a room with a with a an elastic band. You can do it, but is the result useful? I was raised with the understanding that time is an external force acting upon me, and most people I know were raised with the same perspective. So what if I say that time is perceived, or time is an illusion, or time is an awareness of, of entropy, perhaps? Uh, how does that sit with you? So I'm going to... Uh, so, what, uh, yeah, I, I want you to think, like, what if you could look at time differently and by doing so get more done? Uh, I'm going to offer you a way to do this, and the logical part of your brain will reject it, possibly violently. So it's okay to doubt me, but if you'd like to reshape your relationship with time, then I invite you to try this for yourself. If time is perceived, then where does the perception of time come from? I'd say internally. You, you can look at a clock at, to externally position yourself, but the actual perception and experience of time is, is internal. Time as you know it comes from within you. If you can allow yourself to believe that statement true, then what implications follow? If you can allow yourself to believe, uh, again, that time comes from within you, then you are the creator of time as you see it. Spaces where activities actually happen, not time, um, remember, time is just a 
a, a shitty ruler and is more a retrospective measurement. Um, but space is the here and now, the, the present. And it's possible to hold space where everything you need to get done gets done. Um, I'm going to try to show you how. It's, it, it, uh, in a not one-on-one -on -one scenario, we'll, I'll see if I can articulate this uh, well enough. Um, I find this works best for ta task-based activities uh, with diminishing results the more uh, you need to interact with others, such as texting, email, social media, meetings, um, et, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but that could just be me. I, you, you might be able to master this and, and use it in all parts of your life. So it's my belief that space is mine to hold, but interacting with others alters my perception as my world synchronizes between shared realities. So I gain the most control over my space when I don't accidentally synchronize. Uh, again, you gain control over your time and not thinking of it as time, but rather as space, and that measure of space is up to you. Uh, here's a step-by-step -step how I do this. Uh, don't worry if this doesn't immediately click for you. My, I, I welcome you to reach out to me after, um, and you can also find me uh, you know, in the RGB tent, likely, uh, for the remainder of the day and tomorrow morning. Um, okay, so you make a list of all the things you want to get done. Actually put more on the list than you think you're going to get done. Find a place to work where you'll not be interrupted. Pretty basic, you know, advice there, I know. So now set an alarm ahead of your next required synchronization. So again, we're kind of thinking it as when our worlds collide with someone else. So for example, you're meeting a colleague for coffee in three hours. So set an alarm for two and a half hours. So you have no reason to look at the clock or otherwise synchronize with the outside world until that alarm rings. It takes discipline, but I do find thinking about the external interactions uh, as synchronizing your space with others to be helpful because it gives you a clearer picture of what you're trading away when you do allow yourself to become distracted. So think of your time not as time, but as space that you will fill with the things on your list you want to achieve. You set your intention to work through that list and not synchronize with others. And really that's it. Okay? I know it's... it's um, on the surface, it sounds too simplistic. Uh, but if you do try this, I wager you're going to get through everything on your list, plus the stuff you didn't think you're going to get through. You're going to find yourself uh, worried that you set your alarm wrong. And in a panic, you'll, you'll check your clock and realize you still have half hour, 45 minutes left. That's at least been my experience every time I do this, as uh, it is for most people that have tried this. Um, now, there is a catch, and you, you knew there would be a catch. For this to work, you actually have to take ownership of time. You have to fully accept that your perception of time comes from within you, and that you can create time to fill a space. Time is only a measure of that space in retrospect, uh, and, and therefore not super useful. The, the, the space is created with your intent. In practice, uh, this may not be as easy as it sounds, because it means you'll be giving up the ability to use possibly your favorite excuse just as it is for many of us. You no longer get to say, I don't have enough time, or I will never find the time to get all that stuff done. Uh, these can't coexist with the idea that time comes from within you, and thereby you create time, or, or more accurately, you create space. You just drop those phrases from your life, uh, and it won't be easy at first, but you'll quickly be made aware of how often you had externalized time as a way of excusing what you didn't do, or more often true, what you didn't want to do. You also start to notice just how often others use time as an excuse. So, is it science, psychology, or woo? I, uh, for me, I personally don't care. I just find this process works. Um, there's lots of rational reasons that you could say of, of uh, how it fits with traditional uh, time management or, or productivity advice. Um, I'll leave that up to you. This is just uh, my process of, of how I approach it. Um, Give it a go, and you know if, if it works for you, then uh, well, I'm happy. So here's another thought I want you to consider. Uh, see how it lands for you, how it feels in your body. Projects most often fail when there's a misalignment between your goals and your desires. So projects most often fail when there's a misalignment between your goals and your desires. Spend long enough working on various projects and you'll, you'll realize goals are necessary. We, uh, they're critical. Um, 
a project with no goals is like sailing without destination, right? It's just aimless floating, but we spend energy doing so. But you know this, so I'm not going to talk about the importance of setting goals, rather let's discuss desires. Uh, I see desire as the inner driving force that moves us towards the things we want. This sounds obvious enough, yet many creatives uh, really struggle in this area. Um, they set goals whose outcomes do not materially align with their own desires. So then is it any surprise that their energy and drive falter as they near the end of their project? This leading to stalled projects. Quite often our projects have goals that are aligned with external desires, that is, desires held by a person, a group, or institution. Uh, that's their desires, not yours. On the surface, this is all well and good, for the external party at least, uh, but if the project doesn't succeed, then who really benefits? Whose responsibility is it to ensure an alignment between a goal and the desires that fuel us? Who, whose responsibility is that? I, I believe the answer is that all parties are responsible. If I'm commissioning a project and I want it to be successful, then I should try to include uh, persons whose energy will be nourished by the project, not depleted. To do otherwise is simply not sustainable. Uh, but, however, it's not realistic to expect that all projects will be led by someone who cares whether our desires align with their goals and their desires. So we have to work with you know, within the realm of reality here. And so with this in mind, try to find ways in which a project's outcome can tie into your personal goals and desires. Make that your reason to input energy. So without this alignment, though, you'll find lots of other reasons to do other things. So what I'm saying is, um, well, let, let me give you an example. Let us say you're on a team building a combat robot and your role is uh, designing and building the drive system, the mechanics, the electronics that actually move the robot around the, the, the field. Most probably the collective team's desire is to receive the glory in, of destroying all the opponents and winning the tournament. Uh, you likely share in this collective external desire. But what if, what's your personal desire? Have you taken time to figure that out? What's your project? Is your project to finish the robot or is your project to finish uh, your, the personal project actually just the drive system? This isn't to say you're, you're not connected to the collective project. Clearly your project needs to integrate with the other systems. So again, this is a matter of shifting perspective and doesn't need to, to constitute change of, of process. So once you have clarity of what your desire uh, is in the scope of your project, your project, not the collective project, can you then set intent holds and hold space for your creativity? What would the outcome look like if you figured this out before starting a project? If you could feed your desires and you were clear on what success looks like for you personally, would you have more energy available? How would the collective project fare? I very much recommend that you uh, gift yourself space to sit down and get clear on all your current projects. So the stuff you have sitting around, you know, right now, maybe these are paying projects you're currently doing or, or you know, uh, the project that you didn't get finished in time for, for EMF. And, you know, just like think about uh, what desires you, you can align with that project. and. Well, I was going to, yeah, I guess it leads to this thought, which is a thought on unfinished projects. A project that you never start is not an unfinished project. It's just an idea, and it's okay to have ideas. I have countless, like, notebooks filled with ideas, uh, and I know only a few of those will ever become uh, real, and there's just nothing wrong with this. Uh, ideas are cheap until you commit resources to them. So simply don't start projects with outcomes that don't align with your desires. Available re uh, resources are an obvious factor, so uh, money, people, tools, but by far the most important aspect when deciding what projects to start is how they align with your desires. So, so also, just because your desires do not currently align with the project doesn't mean that it never will. Sometimes what, what doesn't align now will again at a future date. Um, and everything will fall nicely into place at that time, but uh, maybe not go as smooth if you started it now. So before you begin a project, that's the moment where you have some control over the external, or at least control over how it will play into your project. This is the best uh, place to take inventory of what, what else you have control over 
and determine if there's abundance enough to see the project through. So there's many times when it's appropriate to push through resistance you feel, but when deciding to start a project is not one of those times. Listen to your body and your gut feelings. The main point here is, is don't start a project that isn't likely to be completed. You, you probably have a good sense of this before you even start it. And if you have that feeling and if, if you don't have an alignment with your desires, if it's not going to, uh, to nudge you forward in life, um, it's best just to not start it. Your success to fail ratio will go way up if, if you only take away this one thing. Uh, so we've talked about a lot. We've talked about you know, collecting unfinished projects. We've talked about the internal versus the external. We've talked about holding a heroic mindset and painting yourself as the hero in, in your narrative, in your projects. We've talked about time and space. And I, I'm pretty sure I've left most of you skeptical on that, but that's fine. We can continue the conversation. I'm happy to. Uh, and aligning goals with desires. And maybe most importantly is just not starting projects that don't align with our desires. So you being here today has been an important first step towards finishing future projects, I believe. Um, by being here, you're acknowledging there's a pattern uh, in your life that you'd like to change and that you're willing to commit effort to breaking this cycle. And this is no small thing. Uh, with that, I look forward to future conversation with you if you feel so inclined to reach out. Um, I want you to feel free to approach me if you see me wandering. Um, like I said before, I'll be in the RGB tent for the, for the few hours uh, that remain. Um, but yeah, also feel free to reach out anytime after the event. Um, that's my, my email is, yeah, jason at makingshitreal.com. <laughs>